So just a quick refresher of what we went over in the last classes. We learned about Fitra and Ibrahim salam from Sister Humera. We also learned about Islam and Ihsan from Sister Hina. And Sister Hajra taught us about Salah and our connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, it looks like some people are a bit shy today, but please go ahead and like write in the comments. We'd love to hear your thoughts and where you guys are from. Um, with that, I think we are good to get started. I welcome you all on behalf of Sister to Sister Manitoba and Ikna. It's awesome to be connected with our new sisters in Islam. You know, we're all here today to seek Allah's pleasure by reviving a sense of spirit of sisterhood among our fellow Muslimas and increase and together we can, you know, strengthen our iman and increase our knowledge. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless this gathering and make it beneficial for both our dunya and akhirah. Ameen. Okay, so we've got some comments now. Sister Hasifa is from Sri Lanka. Wow, mashallah, it's awesome. Sister Tamanna is from India. Mariam Elzab is from Canada. And Sister Mazina is from Winnipeg, Canada. Okay, that's awesome. So first we'll begin with our opening dua by Sister Mariam. Sister Mariam was born and raised in a Hindu family in India. She reverted to Islam in 2004. Mashallah, she is a research associate in the field of neuroscience and a mother of two beautiful young boys. Whenever you're ready, Sister Mariam. Jazakallah khairan, um, Sister Nuha. Um, so I'll make the opening dua now. Audhu billahi minash shaitanur rajeem. Bismillah rahman rahim in Alhamdulillah, in Ahmadu, and Astainu, and Astafiru, but now do be lahim in Shururi and Fusina, women Sayati Amalina, mind ya the Hillahu, Fala Mudilillahu, mind you the Lil Fala Hadiella. Alhamdulillah, indeed, all praise is due to Allah. We praise Him and seek His help and forgiveness. We seek refuge in Allah from our soul's evils and our wrongdoings. He whom Allah guides, no one can misguide. And he whom he misguides, no one can guide. When Ashadu and La Ilaha illa lahu wahtahu la sharika lahu, when Ashadu and Muhammad and Abduhu were a Suluhu. We bear witness that there is no God except Allah alone without, part, without any partners. And we bear witness that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is his Abd and Messenger. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa la Ali Muhammad. Kama saliyata Ibrahima wa la Ali Ibrahim ina kahmidun majid. Allahumma barika ala Muhammad wa la Ali Muhammad. Kama barta ala Ibrahima wa la Ali Ibrahim ina kahmidun majid. Jazakallah khair, Sister Mariam, for that beautiful dua, mashallah. Um, just a side note, if you do have any comments or questions during the lecture, don't be shy. This is an accepting and learning environment. So feel free to use the chat box and we will address them in the upcoming Q&A session, inshallah. Now, please welcome my fellow MYN teammate and my close friend, Sister Fatima, who will be reciting Quran for us. Jazakallah Nuha. Assalamu everyone. I'll be reciting um, Ayatul Kursi today. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض من ذا الذي يشفع عنده إلا بإذنه يعلم ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء وسع كرسيه السماوات والأرض ولا يؤده حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم In the name of Allah, the entirely merciful, the especially merciful. The everlasting, the sustainer of the whole universe. There is no God but He. He He does neither slumber nor sleep. Whatsoever is in the heavens and in the earth is He is His. Who is there that can intercede with Him except by His own permission? He knows what is before the people and also what is hidden from them, and they cannot comprehend anything of His knowledge save whatever He Himself pleases to reveal. His kingdom spreads over the heavens and the earth and the guarding of those 
and the guarding of these does not weary him. He alone is the supreme and the exalted. Jazakallah khair, Sister Fatima, for your beautiful recitation, mashallah. Now we have our amazing speaker for today, Sister Ayana. She is originally from India, but came to Canada 15 years ago and has been in the social work industry for almost eight years now, mashallah. Sister Ayana lives in Steinbach and is, and is working as a youth care worker in Winnipeg. She is currently studying Islamic studies at I3 Institute of Ontario and is studying IERA. Ayana is one of the founders of Sister to Sister and a volunteer with ICNA, and today she will be sharing her story with us. Whenever you're ready, Sister Ayana. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. I am Ayana from Steinbach, and I am a revert Muslim. I will be starting shortly, but first I would like to um, request Sister Homera to tell us a story about the Sahaba's attitude. Sister Humaira, please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, so to all the sisters who have made time to come here today, alhamdulillah, um, I congratulate you that you took out time to connect with our, with our um, maker with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all the sisters who are here to, to understand, um, you know, how we can increase our iman. So today's, um, this, today's story that I want to tell you um, about one of the Sahaba is um, alluded to in the Quran in Surah Hashir, which is 15, uh, Surah number 59, chapter number 59, and in the ayah number, verse number 9. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah is talking about how when somebody came, arrived from Makkah to Medina and how the Ansar, how the, the, the people of Medina who were Muslims, how they treated them. So, so, there, so it, just to give you a background of what was going on, this is when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had moved, had immigrated or migrated to Medina because um, the people of Makkah were persecuting Muslims and they were persecuting Rasulullah So most of the Muslims had moved to Medina. The people of Medina themselves were, the people of Medina themselves had um, accepted Islam in droves. So most of Medina was Muslim and most of the, uh, the Muslims now, because Rasulullah was living there with them, were, you know, would, were living a life, what a life of a Muslim should be in a state that is, you know, Islamic. The people in Mecca were still being persecuted by the leaders of Quraysh. Um, and anybody who accepted Islam was treated really badly. So the people from Mecca, if they accepted Islam, they would move to Medina. Because they wanted to be close to Rasulullah, obviously, and because they wanted to be close to the Muslims. Now, when they moved from Makkah, if they accepted Islam and they were made, obviously made to move, then they could not take their belongings. They just had to leave everything in Makkah and, and just, you know, go there with, their, with the clothes on their backs. That's it. So one day, a man who had accepted Islam from Makkah moves to Medina leaves everything and comes and sees Rasulullah in his masjid, in the Masjid Nabawi, and comes and tells him that, O oh, Rasulullah I have accepted Islam and I want to stay here. Um, and he tells him that he doesn't have anything. He, he doesn't have a place to stay or even enough, you know, he has no wealth, nothing. And he doesn't even have enough to even eat a meal, right? So, Obviously, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he would have, you know, taken him home. He would have given him his food and shared food with him and everything. But you know that our own Prophet Muhammad sallallahu wasn't a man who had a lot of wealth. Or there were there were months when they they wouldn't even cook anything because there was nothing to cook, right? So Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he doesn't have anything and he could not share anything with him. So he. He, he's, he talks to the people around him, the Sahaba, the companions who would stay with him to learn Islam. 
and he says to them rasulullah sallallahu says to them who would host this man as their guest meaning who would take him give him a place to stay for a couple of days and feed him he, the guy didn't have any food right so who would feed him so obviously one of the sahaba one of the companions of the prophet he jumps on that opportunity and says i'll take him and he takes him now this man himself this sahabi this companion himself didn't have enough at home he wasn't a wealthy man either they had food maybe just for that day he takes him goes home tells his wife that i have a guest today and you know uh so what she tells him that we have only enough for maybe one person that's it so he says to her put the tablecloth put all the food whatever you have put a table uh, put a plate and whatever in on the tablecloth and and lower the light you know they had those oil lamps so rasulullah sallam says i mean uh, that this man says to his wife that lower dim the light why dim the light so that the man doesn't see that when i'm sitting with him that i'm not eating so he just pretends to eat and gives all the food that they had to the guest and yes they had kids and he says to the wife put the kids to bed right let them sleep so they don't eat the man doesn't eat himself the wife doesn't eat and they give whatever they have to their guest because this is a new revert who had just come this was a muslim brother that had just come and who needed their help and they were so excited to help them and and just the way they treated them allah subhanahu wa ta'ala liked that so much about that man that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually alluded to this treatment of the new muslims that came uh, to medina how how the 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 medina people how did they accept them how did they treat them so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this aya and this is talking about um, you know some something else and it says that it also belongs to those who were already settled in this abode of hijra meaning medina having come to faith before the arrival of the muhajirun the immigrants and this is the part i want you to concentrate they love those who have migrated to them and do not covet what has been given them they even prefer them above themselves though for poverty be their own lot and whosoever are preserved from their own greed such are the ones that will prosper so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that these people who are the 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 ansar the people in medina how they love the muhajirun the people who come from makka and do the hijra and come to medina as because they have just accepted islam and they have just moved here and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they prefer them over themselves even though they don't have anything their own lot is what they are they, they are poverty stricken they don't have anything but they have no greed nothing they even give whatever they had to the one that just came who, and this is a story of how the sahaba kram radiyallahu anhum how they treated the ones who were who were accepting islam who were entering islam and coming and they needed this kind of help so this is just um, you know um, and uh, to see the attitude sahaba on about their brothers new brothers and sisters new muslim brothers and sisters jazakallah khair assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh jazakallah sister humaira that was a great story mashallah very inspiring the difficulties that the sahabas went through those days is honestly nothing compared to what the reverts and myself are going through currently subhanallah so i would like to inform you guys a little bit about myself and i'll give my intro inshallah and my topic today is my revert story my shahada story and also how to overcome the difficulties of new Mus- that the new muslims face so throughout the presentation i will be sharing a few things throughout my life and the difficulties how i overcame those with the help of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meanwhile i would like you guys to ponder on two questions inshallah and those are have you ever witnessed a shahada and how did it make you feel so if you guys can share your comments in the chat section on zoom and 
in the YouTube comment section for the people who are listening us live. And the other question is, before we start, let's clarify, what is a new Muslim? Now, everybody knows that you're a new Muslim when you take your shahada. You got to say the kalma, right? Ashadu Allah, ilaha illallah, ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Other than that part, how would you describe a new Muslim? So please write those two things in the chat, inshallah. And uh, later on, uh, Nuha can help me to read the comments. Okay, so let's begin with my story. So my name is Ayana and I am originally from India. I came here about uh, 15 years ago. I'm the oldest daughter of the four siblings. And I'm originally from the um, Hindu family. So we used to practice the Vedas. Hindu is not the correct word, it's called Arya. And Alhamdulillah, none of my family members did any idol worship so um that was that was a good thing alhamdulillah and i lived in a joint family ever since i was a kid and i was always curious about our creator as a kid who is god why are we here and things like that. I was always a curious child. And my grandpa, he was a preacher himself. So I was always beside him. He was like my mom, dad, everything. My grandparents, uncle, my parents, and four, us four kids used to live together. And uh, I, I wasn't around any Muslims or um, any... Um, like, I didn't know what was Islam. Like, I was only 14, 15 years old until when I was in India. And um, the only one friend I had in uh, grade 7 growing up, she was the only one I knew. And still, she wasn't like a good friend of mine. She was just a classmate, you know. And during my tuition classes, though, I used to hear the Adhan in the background. It was probably Maghrib. So I used to hear the Maghrib Adhan in the background and that I used to find very soothing. So that was the only interaction that I had about Islam or Muslims or anything. And for the people who know the history of India and Pakistan and the war and all that and the division. So there is always that, you know, oh, Indians hate Pakistanis, Pakistanis hate Indians, especially with the cricket match and the team and all that. So that's what my mentality was. And that's about it. When I came to Canada um, with my family, we all migrated here together. And it was uh, not my choice because I had to leave my grandparents back there and come here. But Alhamdulillah, I came here with my parents and my siblings and I did my high school here in, uh, in Winnipeg. And the first interaction that I had with, I had a few Muslim friends and um, um, one of the friends told me, do you want to come check out the mosque, how it looks like? I'm like, yeah, sure, let me see. So I went inside the masjid and there was a sister. Um, she was advertising about an event of Islam Alive. It was a conference with uh, three sheikh and two sheikhahs. So... I picked up the poster and I'm like, it sounds interesting. I should check it out. So I, I told my friend that, you know, I want to go to this. And uh, he said, yeah, if you want to go ahead, then go ahead. So I, I caught a bus and I, I went there and I stayed through the presentation, the Islam Life Conference. And it was very disturbing to me because they were being very blunt and open about all the all the history and everything and about um i don't want to get too much into it but just in general idea uh, i was very disturbed to find out that 
with all the things that are happening in the world and the government just based on suspicion they throw people in the jail and the families don't even know where they are and uh, i mean obviously terrorism is very bad and people shouldn't do that even islam doesn't say that you shouldn't kill anybody it's it's forbidden in islam and these people are psychopaths and they do all these crazy things so but the thing that the family doesn't know where where their family member is and they're thrown into some jail somewhere in us that nobody knows where it is like that thing hit me really hard and i'm like what the heck how how is this happening and i don't know what's the truth what's not i was like 18 years old at the time 17 years old subhanallah and uh, and luckily at that event itself at islam alive i um there was another sister mashallah sisters are so active with dawa in our community i must say there were sisters uh, with their tables and posters of al maghrib seminar and uh, the title really attracted me eternal journey of life this was back in uh, 2008 of october i clearly remember that was my first al maghrib seminar and ever since then my my journey about learning about islam started and i went to each and every al maghrib seminar one after the other one after the other to learn about islam and everything and uh, sister humaira who just spoke she she knows me from there mashallah she's been a great support in my life and uh, she she can witness to this every time there was break i used to be first person in the line with 10 different questions for the sheikh because i used to find so many similarities you know between vedas and the quran and i couldn't really see what the difference is because whatever my grandpa taught me literally that's what the sheikh was teaching so it was hard for me to convert or to see you know like what's different it's exactly the same thing what what i have learned all my life and what what this person is teaching so the reason why i took my shahada was because of the authenticity of the quran and i cannot say that veda is authentic or not because i didn't study it but uh the authenticity of the quran and every single question that i had i got those answers from the sheikh you know that at a point i mean even today i have many questions but at that moment after attending four five seminars of al maghrib one day sheikh asked me you know are you do you believe that there is only one god i said yeah and he said do you believe there is uh, prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the last messenger i'm like uh, i don't know about that i'm still learning about that and he said so far what you have learned what do you believe i'm like yeah so far from what i've learned i do believe that he is the last messenger and he's like well then you're already a muslim i'm like okay but um i'm still learning and he's like it was sheikh said rage from the fake of love and marriage seminar so he said well you know a person always learns in their life throughout their lifetime even me today being a sheikh i'm still learning as well and subhanallah he asked me if you have any other questions ask me ask me right now what question do you have and i just went blank i didn't have any questions i went through my book i went through my notes like whatever questions i had like they were all answered and just that feeling of i don't know how to describe it like you know if you go on a roller coaster and you just drop like that like that kind of a feeling times 10 times 100 i don't know so i just felt that feeling in my heart and i i just kept on asking questions to myself and i'm like i do believe that there is only one god i've believed that since i was a kid and so far from what i've learned prophet muhammad is the last messenger like i don't see or i don't i haven't heard anything about any other messengers who came after him so that's when that's when i said uh, i'm ready for my shahada and at the al maghrib seminar there at the fake of love and marriage seminar at the university of manitoba i took my shahada alhamdulillah back in july 2011 and that was the one and only reason the authenticity of the quran was the main reason and i just loved the sisterhood mashallah i must thank like all the al maghrib volunteers and sister humaira and manitoba dawa center sheikh yasir sister amra like they were all great support to me i would say compared to other reverts i had a really easy way out because i had so much support so much sisterhood and i am kind of a person who is friendly and outgoing and bold so 
I like to talk to people, so I made good friends, and I started even volunteering with Mag- with Al Maghrib. I believe even before I was a Muslim, <laughs> which is funny. But yeah, so that was my story about my Shahada, and uh, currently I'm just um, a student and learning. And uh, Alhamdulillah, Allah gave me a gift this year in Eid. I found out about I three Institute. and aira so i have started uh, studying at i3 institute and they are a great support like in my in my uh, nine years of being muslim it's the first time that i have been overwhelmed with resources and information and in a good way so mashallah like i3 institute they have classes and seminars like at least four or five times a week and it's very amazing they have something special for sisters as well we'll talk about this um, a little later inshallah so let's come to the question you guys have you ever witnessed a shahada and what is the feeling behind it so nuha if you have anything in the comments there please uh, read it out and sister yeah, hajira if you could type it up Yeah, so yes. we have a first comment from Sister Maryam Elzab, and she says, um, "Hold on, this is scrolling a lot." A new Muslim can feel alone as their family might not agree with them. Oh, this is how a Muslim, how a new Muslim would feel like. I'm assuming. All right, let's do the ones. Have you ever witnessed a shahada? So, uh, Sister Homer says, "When I see a new brother or sister take shahada, I feel so much love for them." I feel the mercy of Allah at that moment. Yeah, we're feeling Allah's rahmat. It's, it's it's a really it's a really big blessing to see someone make that big change in their life. Subhanallah. A sister Hasifa says it feels like a family member coming home. Mashallah. That's such a a nice way to think about it. It's a lovely perspective. And Sister Fatima is saying when I see someone take the shahada, it helps renew my Islam and shows how hard people work. to get to the true deen it makes me thank allah for giving me the blessing of being born muslim alhamdulillah and inspires me to keep learning this beautiful deen myself oh mashallah that i think that's a really good point the muslims who were like born into islam it's such a blessing and i think a lot of us really forget that some people struggle for most of their lives to find the truth or struggle to be a muslim in a non muslim family And I think hearing stories like Sister Ayana's and other reverts really puts things into perspective, you know. So yeah, Fatima, that's a really good point. That's all the comments we have so far. Alhamdulillah, those great thoughts and perspectives. Okay, Jazakallah Khair Nuha, that was great. And what do you guys think? Who is a new Muslim? I already have the answer up there, but still, what do you guys think? Who is a new Muslim? So yeah, first thing is definitely a person who took their shahada, and the main thing is a per, a Muslim that doesn't have much knowledge about Islam. So they would just know the basics about Islam, like there is one God, Prophet Muhammad is the last messenger. There is hell, there is heaven, there is angels, but the pillars of Islam, like they don't practice the pillars of Islam. They don't know much about Ramadan or fasting rules or how to pray properly. so that that's what it means a new muslim that doesn't any muslim that doesn't have much information about or knowledge about islam that would be considered a new muslim for example if a person took their shahada 20 years ago but they never progressed you know beyond beyond this basic knowledge that i just mentioned they would also be considered new muslim so that is the definition of new muslim and i liked your feedback and your points about how it makes you feel when you take your shahada and i just wanted to start with that because i i wanted you guys to come into that zone while we are doing this class and i just wanted to really um request you all that we are going to have a interactive class so please please comment share your thoughts it's a open discussion i'm open to any questions so feel free inshallah we will be doing a q and a in the end for the 15 minutes and i do apologize and I- time presenting like this live 
and I'm going to be all over my slides. So I'm going to begin with the disclaimer. So um, whatever I'm saying today is just basically solely on my experience and my point of view. And it's all from me and from those who I have, those and from me and from those who I've heard the stories from, so my other fellow reverts. And uh, my whole presentation and whatever I'm saying, it's just from a reverts perspective. So um, I just want you guys to just remember that, inshallah. And my introduction I've already given, and why, why am I doing this talk today? I'm basically doing it just to share my journey and life experience and how I overcame my difficulties so other Muslims can benefit from it and other viewers who are in this position today, they can benefit from it, inshallah. And you know, honestly, if you don't hear from somebody who is different from you, you'll never know what experience was it for them. And you'll just guess and assume until you hear straight up from a revert who knows and who has been through that. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, Sister Ayana, I have a question. How did yes, your family yes. react to uh, when you reverted to Islam? My family uh, will come to that, inshallah. My family, they, they didn't uh, know that I was a Muslim. They found out from a mutual friend. But yeah, obviously they didn't react good. I had to go through isolation and stuff. But we'll go through some of those things when we talk about the difficulties that uh, reverts face, inshallah. I'll get back to your question. Anyone has anything else? Any other questions? Okay, so you cannot really look inside a person's heart, right? What their past struggles are or what all things they have been through. Like if you're just looking at a person who you have never seen before, you can just assume that, right? And even though it's been nine years for me, but I still today I feel that feeling, you know, when I took my shahada, I still remember that. I do remember what, what it was like, that feeling of transformation the support and help um, the sisters are going through, that kind of transformation. And I pray and hope to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most merciful and majestic, to make it easy that some of this would make it such, you know, that another person who is going down that road and becomes Muslim would find things easier and would manage the situation better by the permission of Allah. And that is my one of the goals in delivering this kind of a talk today. So, sister, we'll go to the next slide, inshallah. Two more. So 40 to 50% of the converts nowadays they are not they are not remaining upon islam or not becoming practicing muslims and these stats are based on uk and why do you think that is guys we got to really think about this we're going to have a discussion about this later in the breakout room inshallah so please uh, think about it meanwhile And I would like to ask you guys your suggestions and opinion, you know, what we can do as a community, what we can do as sisters to strengthen our sisterhood and support the new Muslims in order to help them in their journey, inshallah. So I would like to, give me one moment. Yeah, let's just jump into that question while we have that here. 
Sister Hajra, let's uh, let's do that. Let's make some breakout rooms while I answer some questions in the comment. So we have Sister Misba from YouTube. Oh, let me pull up my chat here. Why are Muslim reverts called reverts and not converts? So that is because when you convert, you convert from one thing to another, right? And you're called reverts because you were born with the fitra. That was our first day lecture, guys, if you remember. The first day lecture, everybody's born with the fitra. Everybody's born a Muslim. So that's why you're called a revert, because you're reverting to the main religion that you were born with. So that's why we're called revert. Okay, so these are our two questions. And today we have 23 participants, mashallah. No, Sister Hazra. <laughs> okay, so we're going to be um, dividing people into four groups, inshallah. And group one and two will be working on question number one which is what are the common challenges that new Muslims face once accepting Islam? So group one and two will be having a discussion about that. What are some of the common challenges new Muslims face once, you, once they accept Islam? And group two and three will be discussing on question number two. What can we as a Muslim community do to support and help the new Muslims? Okay, so what are your thoughts? So one person from the breakout room, you guys from each group, you can share your comments. If you are comfortable, you can raise your hand. I can unmute your mic and you can share your suggestions on question one. So who was in room one and two? Let's go ahead with the first question, inshallah. What are the common challenges that new Muslims face once accepting Islam? So if you guys are comfortable, you can raise your hand and then we'll discuss it. Okay, I have Mariam here, mashallah. Yes, Sister Mariam, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, so in our breakout room, so we, we discuss the challenges that a new Muslima would face. Sorry, yes, number, number one. Answer. Yeah, number one could be financial distress because she has to leave her family because her family is opposing Islam, that could be number one. So some financial support, some scholarship of something of that sort would help her. And the second thing is after the Shahada, she is sometimes left on her own. And all that she receives from traditional Muslim people is judgment about her clothes, pontification, which kind of does not help at all. All that she needs is, uh, you know, a good friend who would talk about Tawheed, who would talk about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who would talk about the pillars of Islam in a friendly, you know, comforting way uh, to raise her Iman. And not and talking about the outward appearance does not help at all because the Muslima could be from, you know, Europe where there are nude beaches. She could be from that society. And for her to wear a long skirt and a half sleeve top is like very modest. And uh, you, you go out telling her that, you know, your clothes are tight, your sleeves are short. That doesn't help. That should come on, on, on its own, you know, when her Iman increases. So people around her should work on her Iman and not judge her for her lifestyle or her clothes. That will come when her Iman increases. So, yeah, so we have to be careful about that part, that issue. And not to repel yeah. her, but bring her into Islam in a beautiful way. Yeah, that's a very good point, Sister Mariam. Those are a few good points, mashallah. Any other sisters? Who was in group two? Mariam, you were group one or two? Two, group two. Group two, okay. So who? anyone from room one would like to share their thoughts? We have a we're comment. We're still on the first, first question. Yeah, go ahead, Noah. Who was in group one or two? She said, a revert Muslim has to go through restructuring their entire lives. They might have to give up the things they really enjoyed, and it must be a really big adjustment. Yeah, that is very true. 
Yeah, that's true. You're completely evolving your life. It's like from a person, totally different life. It's completely different culture, everything. You got to learn, like as, that's what you say, right? You're a newborn. So you got to learn everything from scratch. You got to adjust. You got to, like women, they can imagine when you get married into a different cultured family. Yeah, that's right. There is a criticism. There is a lot of those things. Okay, I need somebody from room one. You got to share your okay. suggestions. I was in room one. I can speak um, on Go behalf ahead. of um, room one. So we talked about um, two things. Uh, one of the sisters mentioned how it must be really hard to get uh, acceptance from your family. And for some reverts, they might never get acceptance for their family. So that must be a really big challenge for them because, you know, those are the closest people to you. Um, and then they also talked about, that sister also mentioned how now they might not be allowed to um, do things that they really liked. Like, for example, if they used to celebrate Christmas and it was a big part of their life and they looked up like forward to it, now they won't be able to do that anymore. So things like that. And then um, I spoke about, I spoke about in the room that just having support. So like having multiple types of support, having social support and like religious support. And like um, you really have to build a whole new network of people. And that takes a lot of time. So, um, you know, right when you just start as a reaver, it might seem like really daunting. So that might be a really big challenge for the uh, revert sisters. Yeah, Jazakallah Khair. That was amazing, mashallah. Noah, do we have any comments from social media? Anybody from Facebook? Um, not to my knowledge. I put them in the chat. Oh, there you go. So, yeah. So there are two comments on our Ikna, um, Ikna sisters um, live streaming. Uh, one of the sisters has said that loneliness is one of the challenges because she feels left out from the community. Um, and there's one more saying that acceptance into the family is one of the issues because they're not accepted by their family anymore. Amna, Sister Amna has given a good comment. She said they also may not be trusted and community does not help, unfortunately. Some stories I heard were good, but I've also heard that sometimes they wouldn't find the support they needed. They would be approached aggressively when they make mistakes. Yeah, it's a really good point. That is true. That is true. Unfortunately, it happens. And that comment from Sister Amna was from Facebook. Mashallah. Um, um, <clears throat> Sister Ayana, I have a couple of more comments from the Sister to Sister Facebook page. Yeah, um, go ahead. So lack of support and follow up to re to learn the religion and feel the brotherhood and sisterhood in an Islam. They may lose ties with their family and community and they need acceptance for who they are. They need understanding and support and guidance. Um, and she also, she further explained that I have witnessed few and I always cry. It is a weird feeling. So that was Halima from Sister to Sister Facebook page. Okay, Jazakallah Khair to all the Facebook and uh, Ikna and Sister to Sister audience out there. That was a good discussion, guys. Any other thoughts? Any other comments? So we basically covered, covered all the points, mashallah. Next slide, please. We'll go to the second question later on, probably after a break, inshallah. So you guys have a little more time to think about the second question. What can we do as a community? And here are some of the challenges, the top 12 challenges that reverts face. And I mean, top 12, like it changes, right? According to the situation, according to the generation we're living in, it, it's different every time. So to begin with, the first thing is shaitan, right? You're always on the shaitan's radar. The person who's helping you, the person who is receiving the help, the revert, the person who is giving dawa. There is always a shaitan trying to play with your intention or trying to distract you to something else, whispering doubts in your ears. The second is abandonment, abandonment by family and friends, which many of you sisters already mentioned. That is a very, very crucial one too. And it, it strikes straight to your heart. You know, your closed loved ones, they abandon you even though you're the same person 
by behavior, by inside in your heart, you're still the same, like you were a kid, like you were a teen with them. But uh, Saiba, uh, TAs, could you please mute the participants? Just a look here. And number three is unemployment. So unemployment happens several times, you know. Um, sometimes, especially with the sisters, they wear their hijab and people might have some politics or they'll do some things and um, they'll treat them differently. And even with brothers, sometimes because of the name, they, they don't get hired, the resumes, they go straight in the garbage. So unemployment is also a big one. And debt and financial difficulty, many reverts, they come in Islam with the debt that they already have, and then they learn it's riba, you know, it's not allowed, it's haram. So they have to deal with that financial difficulty. Also, uh, I think there is already one. Yeah, number eight, forced to leave home or hide their faith. That is also kind of related to uh, financial difficulty, right? Because if your parents disown you, and you're you're kicked out of the house. What are you gonna do if you're in if you're in high school or even you're 18, you're in college, you know? And especially in, in the culture, like in India, Pakistan, parents usually pay for the tuition and everything, not like the Canadian culture. And suddenly, you know that that's it. You're getting kicked out because you became Muslim. So there's going to be financial difficulty. You, people might end up homeless. Also, there is the victim abuse. I, alhamdulillah, I'm grateful that I took my shahada here in Canada. I don't know what, what the circumstances would have been in, 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 in India if I would have done that. You know, maybe I would have been locked up in the door, but I don't know. I, I would have climbed out of the room chimney window, but uh, you never know. So it is difficult, subhanAllah. Um, legal troubles. Yeah, nowadays, especially, I don't know if you guys know what's happening with India. There is a thing going on called Love Jihad and people having intercaste, interrelated marriages. They need to uh, claim in the newspaper two months in advance that they are converting and getting married to a, an out of the religion person and then all these things. So it's all politics. And there is a uh, also, the challenge with the revert is that you have very little knowledge about Islam. Like, you know, the, the basic you might have learned and um, read about Islam because otherwise you wouldn't have taken your shahada. So you do know about Islam, but very little information, basic information. Not all the rules and rulings and proper way and um, the ease that Allah has given us for fasting, for uh, during... Ramadan, for Hajj. So there are many, many things that we still have to learn as new Muslims. So that is also a really big one, you know, very little knowledge about Islam. Not practicing the basic obligations of Islam. So when you are a revert, you got to learn everything from scratch. You don't know Arabic, you don't know the language, you don't know how to pray. So the obligations, the fard, praying salah five times a day, how are you going to Like online, there are resources, but, you know, they don't always have right information. Online could be um, a positive and negative, both, both areas. So that, that is also, also a big thing. And uh, obligations, we know that it's first, but we need help with that. As reverts, we need help with that. Number 10, I guess I already covered 10. Not receiving help from Muslim, uh, from the local community. You guys already mentioned that. And Sister Halima also from Facebook shared her thoughts on that. That's true. Loneliness, definitely. Definitely. Your friends are gone. Your family is gone. You're lonely. You don't know what to do. And then at the same time, if the Muslim community is also not helpful, then then where where is the person supposed to go? Who Who are they supposed to ask help from? And then there's identity crisis. There can, there can be like a whole day of lecture about identity crisis. So you got to erase the entire identity and the things and everything, your old habits, whatever you did, and you got to start over 
all over again. You got to learn new things. You got to learn the way of Quran and Sunnah. You got to implement on that. And and you can't really do that when when um, there is loneliness. You know, there are also very mis many misconceptions. One of them being, for an example, when you are a revert, you need to change your name. No, that is that is not Islam. That is not the law. You only need to change your name if your name's meaning is shirk. Only then you need to change your name. So there are many things. These are all the different challenges that reverts have to face. And we really need to think about, you know, what are we doing as a Muslim community, as sisters of Islam, to help our fellow sisters. Usually what happens is, once a sister takes shahada, everybody's excited, lots of hugs and welcoming and mabruks and gifts and inviting over for dinner or coffee. And then after a month or after two, three weeks, it's gone. It's zero. After two, three months, you don't even remember that woman's name who took her shahada. We should be responsible for our fellow sisters, for our fellow Muslims, because they are from our ummah and they're our neighbors and we know them. We were there during their shahada. So that responsibility falls on us. So I'm going to leave you guys at that thought and we are going to take a quick five minute break, inshallah. So you all can freshen up and I'll see you back at... 2 10 p.m. and then we'll have some announcements inshallah so think about that what can we do as a community to make this better and jazakallah care Okay, Assalamu alaikum everyone. Hope everyone's back from the break. Okay, so I'm just going to jump into some announcements. So a reminder to set your alarms for tomorrow 1 p.m. CST to make sure you don't miss our final day five of this winter series. Myself alongside my MYN team will be sharing the stories of three female companions, so make sure to catch us then. We will also be having a bonus Q&A session after the day five class. So email your questions ahead of time to sister to sister Winnipeg at gmail.com with the subject bonus Q&A. For the announcements. And let's go ahead with the discussion, guys. So please share your comments in the chat on Zoom and in the comment section on Facebook, inshallah. So what can we as a community do to support and help new Muslims? What are some of your thoughts? And I believe, Noah, there are already some comments in the chat on yeah. Zoom, if you would like to start with that. Mr. Homara said, the community should embrace new reverts like their own, give them moral and emotional support as they usually do not have that from their family now. That is a excellent point. Um, I was also with Sister Homara in her group. So just adding on to that, I think it's really up to us to make that first step and reach out to new Muslims because they might be a bit lost or a bit hesitant because coming to a new religion is really daunting and really scary. So we should make them feel accepted and loved in their new Muslim community. Do we have any other comments? Yeah, that is so true, Sister Noah. And I don't know if you guys have heard of this, but uh, UK, they have these Muslim retreats where they invite all the reverts 
for four or five days and they have their hotel and food and everything all set up. They teach them how to pray. They show them how to make wadu, everything like in person. And it's not more like an Islamic uh, study environment. It's more like a holiday vacation environment. And you're mingling with other Muslims and getting to know each other. And that is a very good welcoming um, system that we should even try to do something like that here in Canada. Yeah, I totally agree with that. That sounds like such a good idea for them to like make new connections and just feel kind of at home in the new community. I think that's really important. Yeah, Anyone that's right. Group three or group four, want to say anything? Yeah, group three and four. What were your guys' discussion? What group were you in, Noha? I was in group three, I believe. Okay, so anybody from group four, you guys want to share your uh, comments? Okay, then let's proceed, inshallah. See, this is the main question that we need to come up with solutions, you guys. That's that's how we can strengthen our sisterhood and and do something about the ratio of 40 to 50 percent of reverts leaving Islam after Shahada or not practicing. You know, we need to really, really ponder on this question. Oh, we have a comment from Sister Maher who says, make sure to be in touch with them if they need anything. Yes, that's a really good point. That's true, yeah, always being in touch and staying in touch. And sometimes, you know, the Muslims feel overwhelmed and we'll get into that, inshallah. What is the right way to approach a revert? So we will get into that as well. So next slide, please. So there are three, three main steps that the approach that you guys can take to um, welcome a Muslim. First is, of course, welcoming the sister, showing her that sisterhood of Islam that, that alhamdulillah, I was able to receive by the al Maghrib Girls and Manitoba Dawa Center, Ikna. So we got to show that sisterhood to the new, new Muslima. And at the same time, you also have to maintain a little bit of boundary that she's not getting overwhelmed, you know, and getting getting a phone number, uh, an email address, that is important because usually people's phone numbers change, but their email address don't. And then the second step is teaching. First step of is the pillars of Islam that we learned after Shahada, it's Salah. So definitely the, the revert Muslim, the new Muslim is going to need help with learning how to pray. And then empowering and mentoring them, so being there for them as a as a mentor, you know, as as a friend, as a companion, whatever you want to call it, because we already went through all the difficulties that reverts go through, and it's very important that they have that at least one person, you know, to to speak with, to go back to, to ask questions, so they don't feel that isolation, that abandonment. Okay, next slide, please. I'm sorry, guys, I have a cough, so I'm going to be muting my mic in between. So after taking Shahada, for the people who do Dawa work, you know, if you know a sister who you're uh, teaching Islam or introducing her into Islam and things like that, and when she becomes a revert, then what? That's the main question, right? Because that's when a revert needs help. Once they've become a Muslim, then what do they do? So you as a person who's given da'wah should stop all your da'wah activities. Yeah, you heard it right. You should stop all your da'wah activities and focus solely on that new Muslim. Because that person needs your full attention. They need your support. They need everything. You should go out, you know, Feel free, like talk to them, go to the mosque, create that bond, go for a coffee or arrange some potlucks, introduce them in your friend circle, in your team, as in your dawa team. 
meet, uh, make them friends with other, other Muslim sisters. Engaging with the reword is the main key. One of you guys already mentioned that, right? Engaging with the reword. And, you know, a family, a family just doesn't leave a newborn on his own and learn to raise themselves, right? Like, there, there's Mowgli's just in the cartoons, not in real life. So even it's the same, like revert sister or any revert Muslim. They need that support from the family. And who's the family? Their own personal families already abandoned them. So it is their community. The community becomes the family. So we have a big role. We have big shoes to fill. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to share some of the uh, tips with you guys for first meeting. So when you meet a new sister, a new Muslim, what do you do? Like once they take their shahada, then what? So within the first few days, it's important that, you know, you guys reach out to them. And that could even be like not meeting in person at the first time because you're a stranger to them. They're not going to give give you your, uh, they're not going to give you their address. So talking on the phone or just checking up on them, you know. When they take their shahada, that is that is the main um, chance for you guys to connect with them, exchange numbers, exchange email. Like I said, you know, people don't change email that often compared to phone numbers. And what are some type of uh, questions that you shouldn't ask a revert? And what are the things that you should ask a revert? So some things... The main common question that, that a revert gets, you know, tell me your story. Tell me your Shahada story. And that could be overwhelming for some of them. So you guys got to make sure that you have that gentle approach and you have that little, little bond with that sister and not just flat out, you know, you're meeting them first time. You're an unknown person and you want them to tell you about your revert story. And for some sisters, it's fine, you know, like, for example, I'm open with sharing my story. It's, it's fine with me, but it's for some sisters, it's not comfortable, especially when they don't know you. And some unwanted and repetitive questions that people have is, when are you going to start doing this? For example, when are you going to start wearing hijab? When are you going to start fasting? When are you going to hajj? You know, it's, it's patience. We got to take one step at a time. Yeah, I'm a revert, I know it's fard. But slowly it takes time, one step at a time. You don't know their circumstances, what's going on in their house or what they're dealing with or what could happen if their family finds out that they're a revert. So they are going through that struggle themselves and then receiving that criticism or that question, you know, it's not fair. I know you guys are curious and I'm curious too. I was curious, I had so many questions and it's good to ask questions, but the main thing is the approach, the way uh, people ask questions, you know, the tone and especially your relationship. And it's okay to ask a person question when like, for example, Noah, suppose she's my best friend and she knew me as a Hindu and I became a Muslim. She's asking me questions. I'm comfortable with sharing with her whatever she asks because we are friends. But it makes that area becomes uncomfortable when you don't know the person. And this is the main question that really is not, not polite, not right even to ask anybody. Straight up like you're judging, you know. So, did you take shahada for a guy? Seriously? Just by hearing that, you know, it, it didn't happen to me, alhamdulillah, but I have heard stories from other sisters. And it's so sad, you know, it just takes away the ability to find this truth that Allah has guided us. We have done the research and we accepted Islam. And, and it's, it's really sad that when that happens. So now you guys might be thinking, I'm saying these are the things you should not do with the reward. So what should we do then? What's the right way to do it? So here are some, some uh, advice here. So first you should... Every situation is different, right? Every revert is different. The situation is different. You got to see what kind of a conversation you guys are having. If it's your classmate or, or just a passing by person, then of course you're not going to ask them serious 
personal questions. How close you are to this person? We already spoke about that. How comfortable does this person seem? So when you're in a conversation with the reward and you think that, oh, it's making them uncomfortable, stop. Change the topic. Talk about your common area, common grounds. And inshallah, they will open up slowly. They will open up slowly. Establish a good relationship. A non-judgmental good relationship. And also at the same time, and I would say in, um, in your second or third meeting, re-establishing the importance of prayer and offering them to learn how to pray salah because that is one of the fourth pillars of Islam. And it is important. Next slide, please. Okay, so the interactions and common struggles. Sorry, one moment. Okay, so what are some of the things that shouldn't be said and some of the things that should be said like in, in what kind of a way, right? And we already touched base a little bit about that. So having condescending comments or harsh comments, judgmental comments, that's, that's not right. So there are two ways, like one is a condescending way and one is a gentle and caring way. And people don't do it intentionally, you know, it happens sometimes. But you got to be really careful because you already, we already learned about all the phases that reverts go through in their journey. And sometimes what happens is the comments and stuff, they come from a place of anger or arrogance, you know. For example, at... Um, at a masjid, there is a sister praying salah, and she's not wearing appropriate hijab as per the Quran and Sunnah. And once she's done praying, you go up to her and you tell her, Oh, by the way, sister, and you will also know that she's a revert, okay? And you know that it's possible she might know, not know this. So you just approach the sister and you, you say, Oh, by the way, sister, you know, you're not wearing the correct hijab it's not the right behavior your prayers are not going to be acceptable you need to change that is that is unacceptable guys there is a correcting way we need to correct reverts i was corrected several times but there is a way to approach you know in this situation that person they would not want to correct them, that behavior in future. That bad memory will be attached to it. So we have to be careful the way we approach. It should be out of a place of concern, gentle, polite, and also from a place of knowledge. Like several times people, people try to educate others just based on their culture, not, not Islam, not knowledge, which is not, that, not authentic. That creates more confusion. Subhanallah. And you generally, generally you guys, like we cannot know, right? What a person knows, how much knowledge do they have about Islam? So we can, can't really just guess, you know, oh, she already knows why she's still wearing those tight clothes, you know? Like, doesn't she know that she should be wearing proper hijab while praying at least? So those are some of the things that we need to be careful about. Now, I would like to give you guys some, some tips on first meetings, right? When you guys meet up a sister first time, we already spoke about that a bit. You guys should talk about some common grounds. What are your interests with each other? You know, what are the common things that you guys do? And also make sure that you set up a timing for next meeting, for future meetups. So there is always that thing that, you know, you're getting back to the person. They know that you're going to be in, be in touch. It's not a one-time thing. 
Okay, let's see what we have next. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, give me a minute, guys. Okay, so we are going to, I would like to share um, a really wonderful verse from the Quran. And... So it is from uh, Surah number 6, Ayah 122. Allah says, Can those who had been dead, to whom we gave life and a light with which they can walk among people, be compared to those in complete darkness from which they can never merge? That is how the misleads of the disbelievers have been made appealing to them. And this is, this is a very beautiful and important ayah. It says, and you know, when I think about it, the contrast is exactly as Allah describes it. Someone who is dead and became alive it is a complete and total change, a complete change in every aspect, like the change from death to life or from life to death. Subhanallah. And it is that much of a change. Can those who had been dead, to whom we have given life and a light with which they can walk among the people, be compared to those in complete darkness from which they can never merge? So basically, So it's talking about the people, you know, who are in darkness and is never going to come out of it. And just look at these two beautiful examples that Allah has given us in this ayah. The first one is the, the transition, you know, the transition from death to life. Because that, because that heart for Islam that heart before Islam was dead. That body before Islam was dead. And Islam was given to that person and that person came to and then the person's heart came to back to life. And that's what the ayah is talking about here. The heart was given life after its death and that body was brought back to life after its death and the soul was given a real life a life that means something you know and matters to somebody after that had been dead and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave another example The one who has been given a light, like the one who is stumbling in darkness and is never going to come out. Just look at the differences between those two. Just imagine. A person confidently walking, you know, walking with the lamp knows where they're going. They can see their footsteps ahead of them. They know what, what is ahead of them, what they want to achieve in life and what their, what their steps, where their steps are going to be placed, you know, avoiding the bumps and the ditches and the rocks and the way and confidently walking amongst the people. And on the other hand, we have the people who is stumbling about in dark, just stumbling in the darkness. 
and maybe years they have stumbled in the dark and they're never going to get out of it. This is a huge, huge transformation, subhanAllah. They have never been able to find a path to anything. They have never been falling over. They're hurting themselves. I mean, they have been falling over, over and over, you know, and they're hurting themselves. And they have not been able to find a way out of it. And then suddenly, that person has light. And they can see everything in front of them. Just look at that difference. Look at the difference of transformation between this situation and that situation. SubhanAllah. So this really requires, requires tools. It requires tools in order to make this transformation. And us as a community, we need to help our fellow Muslims, our reverts with those tools. So they can get out of the darkness and stay in light. Not just abandon the light and go back the old ways. And personally, myself, being a revert, I would really encourage all the Muslims, especially the reverts. Number one, like it says in Surah Asr, you should keep in touch with knowledge. Knowledge is the key. If you don't have knowledge, there is no growth, no development. You can't thrive. There is no nurturing. And then after knowledge, there is practicing knowledge, putting it into actions. You need to act upon that knowledge. So that is very important. And I would call it knowledge of continuous learning. So continuously, regularly learning knowledge, always keeping in touch with that. Even if you're reading one ayat, you know, one sentence from Quran or, or a hadith. Hadith is the, the way of life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So even, even reading one ayah or one hadith and implementing that in your life, it is very important. And I just have a few minutes left. So I would uh, quickly just want you guys want to share some of the things that I did when I was in, in hardship in my life. So at a point, I was surrounded with a lot of difficulties, abandonment, and coming back to Sister Hajira's question. So when I took my Shahada, my parents did abandon me, as in they boycott me. They didn't speak with me, but I'm also stubborn, <laughs> subhanAllah. So I was kicked out of my house. I was given the option to choose between my parents or my husband. And uh, I told them, you know, you both are like my two eyes. I cannot give one and keep one. I love both of you guys. Please don't make me do this. But I understand at the same time what my parents are going through. And I have three younger siblings. So my parents used to say, you know, you're the oldest. You're getting married out of the culture, out of the religion. Your younger siblings, your sister especially, are going to have a hard time to get married. And, and that is true. Culturally, it happens. People from India, they might know. It's very common. So that was one situation. My parents didn't speak with me for almost two years, subhanAllah. I wasn't allowed to go back home. Um, but I was, excuse me. So I was, uh, I was stubborn. I still went back home. My dad told me, if you come back here, I'm going to call the cops. I don't want you in my house. You made a decision. You go stay with your husband. No need to come back here. I'm like, I will come back. Go ahead. Call the cops. I have the right to see my siblings. And no matter what you say, you are still my parents. I have your blood in me. And I just walked off. 
And I used to I used to go back to my parents' house. You know, visit them. And I was just like an invisible person, you know, in the house to my parents. They didn't used to speak with me. I just used to go there to visit my siblings, my grandma. But I had faith, you know, I had faith and trust in Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That he would make things easier. They'll come around. And alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, you know, they did come around. I am the living example that your parents cannot abandon you. They are your parents. They will eventually come around. You have to stay strong. You have to have faith in Allah. He's going to do everything. That's the best for you. And I would suggest the reverts out there. You know your situations. You know what's right, what's wrong. You know how your parents are going to behave when they know that you're Muslim. But you have to stay strong on your faith. And it's very hard to balance, you know, the what Allah says that you got to respect your parents and you got to follow Islam at the same time, right? Respecting your parents is a big thing in Islam. But you got to remember that if your parents are telling you to do something that is against Islam, then you can't do that. If your friends are leaving you, they're abandoning you, that's fine. Going to Jannah, having paradise is more important. They are, those friends have left you, you'll have better friends in heaven. So coming back to the situation, so that's what happened like about almost two years. I uh, My parents didn't speak with me. And then once they started talking to me, my brother um, uh, boycotted me because he found out that I was a lot involved in Dawa and stuff and doing a lot of community service with Al Maghrib. I was volunteering and I was so stupid. I was so naive at the time, subhanAllah. He had his new iPhone and we were having an Al Maghrib volunteers meeting and we had to do a conference call because the Sheikh was giving us some tips. So I told him, can you add three, four people on the call? Because I couldn't do it with my phone, right? That was a new iPhone thing at the time. And I guess he heard the conversation of Dawa and all of that. So I guess that conversation or that phone call made him realize that, you know, oh, she's gone too much into Islam or whatever. And I, I used to wear hijab. Like, alhamdulillah, from day one, I took my shahada. I never removed my hijab. So alhamdulillah. My parents didn't like that. I know they used to get mad. So what I used to do is before before entering the house, I just used to uh, remove my hijab so it doesn't hurt my parents' feeling. And as soon as I reached the patio, I used to put it on. And we used to go to the restaurant or family dinner. You know, they used to say, we're not going to take you like this. You remove that thing. Otherwise, you don't. we're not going to take you like this. I'm like, okay, that's fine. Just bring me some takeout. I'm fine with that. So there were some struggles, but you know, you got to take them day by day with humor. And I know what's important for me, what's important for my deen, what Allah has made the rules he's made for the benefit. And I've always feel safe in, in hijab, you know, less, less people checking you out, staring eyes, feeling uncomfortable. Like I felt safe in my hijab. And my husband, he never implemented hijab on me. That was my own choice. He even says, oh, we are going to the beach. Why are you wearing hijab? I'm like, ah, because it's my hijab. You got nothing to say about it. It's between me and Allah. So zip it, please. So you guys really need to, uh, there is a really fine boundary, you know, between parents and what you need to follow what Allah says and at the same time you don't have to hurt their feelings for example I used to try not to pray in front of my parents because that would make them more angry 
So I used to pray in the furnace room, I remember, because I did eventually move back with my parents after, after uh, they had uh, asked me to leave the house. I used to pray in the furnace room between the hydro thing, you know, and the wall in the dark so nobody could see me. And at the same time, my parents, um, if they see me praying, they, it wouldn't hurt, my, hurt their feelings because they wouldn't be able to find me, right, in the house. So, yeah, I dealt with the boycott situation with my parents for about two years. And then my brother after that. And my brother is one and a half year younger than me. So we were like best friends. Like we shared everything with each other. So that hit me more hard than than uh, being boycotted from my parents, actually, to be honest. And uh, he sat me down one day and said, you know, either you choose your husband and Islam and the way you dress. Well, he didn't literally say Islam. He just said the way I dress and my husband. He said, either you choose him or you just become like my old sister like you were and the way you dressed. I cannot accept this. So it's your choice. Whatever you want to choose, you choose. If, if uh, you want to go that way, then I'm done. I'm done talking to you. That's it. And he literally cut off ties with me for, for um, almost three years. And same thing, you know, when I used to go home, he never talked or anything. I used to try to make conversations, but nothing. And at a point in my life, I dealt with uh, bullying from work. Not because of hijab. While at the same time, I was dealing with the family isolation. And my husband at the time wasn't there with me. He was far away. So I was completely surrounded with problems, subhanAllah. And I, I just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a kind of a person that likes challenges in life. So I remember I used to literally like sit in a room and cry and all that stuff. But I used to cry to Allah. I used to pray to Allah. I used to complain to Allah. I just literally used to sit and have conversations with him. Okay, fine. You're going to throw this problem in front of me? I'll take it. I'll, I'll get through this. I'll come out of this. I'll show you. And I didn't have any friends at the time. Like some sisters that I had from Al Maghrib and here and there they moved. And some of them got married. And, you know, it is very important what I learned from those days that have, had I just, you know, reached out, just made that one phone call, you know, any of those sisters would have been there for me. And I haven't, I haven't dealt with any of the mental health uh, um, situations, alhamdulillah, but I think that that's what's called depression. I didn't sleep for about two, three days. and. Uh, that was the zone that I was in, you know. And then I remembered, I remembered the Al Maghrib course that I took, the attributes of Allah, the names of Allah. So I looked for my book and my notes from back two, three years ago. And uh, I just started reading the names and the meanings of Allah, being in that emotional state, you know being surrounded with problems from work, from family, everywhere. And also, at the same time, what was going on, I had two revert Muslims who were my good friends. They were also twins from Australia. And then I had another sister from Winnipeg who were having some problems with somebody calling CFS on her child, someone from the community, and then my revert Muslim friends, um, the Aussie girls, I call them, my pals. <laughs> so one of them were, was also starting to deteriorate from Islam, you know, starting to go to a, back to the old ways. So that all really affected me, you know, that what, what am I doing something wrong? Like, am I not a good enough friend? What else can I do? SubhanAllah. So at that time, during those difficult times and in that situation, being surrounded by problems emotionally, mentally, 
just stressed out. And then looking through that book, the names of Allah, that really helped me. That really helped me in life. And when I had nobody with me, my best friend was Alwali. The people who heard me, I used to pray to Al Jabbar, the justice provider, you know, the friend, the guardian. And that what helped me come out of everything. And I came out of it as a stronger person. Alhamdulillah. So that is my suggestion, you guys. Always have faith in Allah and always trust in Him. He knows what's best for you. And He will. I used to, you know, I used to have these. I used to have these screensavers on my phone, you know, these uh, quotes from Quran or these fancy posters that you find here and there. Allah will only test you so much that you can handle. And the more Allah tests you, the more he loves you. So those things used to always encourage me and keep me positive and strong. And I came really strong out of all of those hardships. And I became a better person, a better Muslim, more appreciative. And now everything is fine, normal. Alhamdulillah, my brother talks to me. My mom and parents talks to me. My sister, little sister, she's having a little attitude towards me. But it's not because of I'm Muslim. It's because of some other sister, sister things, you know. So that's all I would like to share about uh, the hardships that the reverts go through and how you come out of it from my perspective. And just to conclude uh, really quickly, the three steps that we went through earlier. So it's very important that when you're, um, when you're with a fellow sister, you gotta be an active listener. You gotta be present and concentrate on what's being said. There should be empathy. You should understand their issues and always direct them back to Allah and what Allah said, how to get out of this kind of a situation. And empowerment and follow-up. Follow-up is very important. We need to motivate each other and tackle their situations with the help of Allah. And always follow up, check up on them, invite them during Eid, Ramadan, even randomly. Especially for rewards, so Ramadan and Eid, it's so lonely, subhanAllah, I'm telling you. Even though I have a Muslim husband, it has still been lonely for me. And that's why we created our sister to sister group. So I'm going to end here. If you guys have any questions, feel free to raise your hand and unmute your mic. And we can quickly go through that. Sorry, I took a little more 10 minutes. Got a little emotional there, subhanAllah. So any ladies have any questions? Just raise your hand and then the TA will unmute your mic, inshallah. Or if you can't speak at the moment, you can write your questions in the chat and we'll answer them. Over to you, Noah. Sister Ayana, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. It's not an easy thing to do, so we really do appreciate it. Um, I think you touched the hearts of everyone here today, myself included, and I'm sure we all now have more motivation and a renewed realization of our duty to reach out to new Muslims and be there for them. So once again, Jazakallah Khair, Sister Ayana, for sharing your journey to Islam with us. I would love to have a lot of encouraging comments for you, Sister Ayana. So yeah, if everyone, if anyone has a question, um, write them in the comments and we can go over them together, inshallah. If anyone does have a question, my good friends from MYN will be hosting the Q&A session. Um, Sister Aisha and Sister Fatima. Yeah, Jazakallah care everyone for your lovely comments. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask any personal questions. I don't mind answering. I'm like an open book, so go ahead. While we are waiting for you guys to type up your questions, um, I just wanted to share a few slides with you and inform you about a few organizations and some awesome events that they have. 
So that'll give you a little bit of time to um, write up your questions and then Fatima and Aisha can help us with that, inshallah. So Sister uh, Hajira, if you can pull up the next slide, please. One more. Yeah, just a reminder again, guys, there will be a quiz tomorrow, inshallah. And it's a surprise quiz. We're going to have fun. So try to go through the recordings if you still haven't. And uh, also tomorrow is our last day, final day. So instead of finishing at 3 p.m. CST, we're going to be finishing at 3.30. So the last 30 minutes, we're going to have a QA. and a And we're not going to live stream for the bonus Q&A. It's going to be solely on Zoom, so you can even ask your personal questions and everything. It's not going to be all over the media. I mean, not media, the social media. So, inshallah, email your questions ahead of time on the email address listed on the screen there. Sister to sister, wpg at gmail.com. And you can also see the email address in the comments there on Facebook. You guys can read the comments meanwhile, if there are no questions. Sorry, I was muted as I was talking. Okay, so um, so Amna Iqbal message that Barakallahu Fiki Ayana. This brings to light just how great of a change reverts go through. Alhamdulillah, from their own choice, and truly Allah is the one who guides, but they find themselves disappointed with the lack of community um, support and understanding. And that's what Nema from Facebook um, said. And she also said, lots of strength for you, my dear. Yeah, Jazakallah care for everybody. The lovely comments. Um, Sister Humera um, said in the chat, may Allah give you a lot of ajr for all your hardships in the way of accepting Islam and turn to Allah. There's a lot of really sweet messages um, for your story. Mm, Sister Humera also mentioned that after every hardship is ease and we need to be strong, we see from your story that Allah gave you strength to bear the hardships. And like you mentioned, um, Allah only tests you as much as you can handle. Jazakallah care everyone. Very lovely comments and strength. And that goes for all the reverts out there. Oh, I, I think there is a question in the comments. Yeah, so there's a question from Facebook that's asking, how do you find other Reaver sisters in your city? Like, how do you find, how do you meet other Reaver sisters in your city? Um, we want to support the Reaver sisters, but don't know how to find them. Okay, um, so sister, I would like to ask you first, what, uh, what city are you from? So I live here in Steinbach. And I work in Winnipeg, so I'm from Manitoba, Canada. So I, I think um, I got connected through Reverts through the Masjid. So um, in, in 2012, you guys might have, people on Facebook and YouTube might have seen the video in the break time about the Sister to Sister organization. So we, us few Reverts and a bunch of uh, sisters in Manitoba Dawa Center, we created this organization called Sister to Sister to help other revert Muslims so they have some support and um, some resources and some halakas and things like that to go to. And to answer your question, you can always uh, go to the mosque and speak with uh, any, any of the volunteers there and inform them that if there's any revert sisters, please give them my contact info. And um, also like social media is really a good tool as well based on um, for that purpose. You can always look into um, like, for example, in Winnipeg, we have um, Manitoba Sisters Group on Facebook. We have a Winnipeg uh, Muslim Sisters Group on Facebook. So there are a lot of Muslims there and you can always uh, ask about the reverts and things like that. But yeah, definitely the mosque and social media, inshallah. If you guys have any other questions, go ahead. We will be finishing soon. So I just want to share these few slides here quickly. 
So the first one, this is our sister to sister page that's on the screen right now. This is the organization I was talking about. And these are some of the things that we do. So you guys can follow us and in order to stay in tuned with our future events, you can just go on at sister to sister WPG. And that'll be a pink poster there, the profile pic. So you can follow that page and you'll be hooked up with all the online events that we'll be having, inshallah. And you want to go to the previous slide, Sister Hajra? And this organization is I3 Institute. So they have this really am amazing thing. I also actually contacted them when I had some uh, Islamic doubts and some Islamic questions that I was seeking answers to. It's called FCC at i3institute.ca. That's Faith Crisis. And they have some volunteers and team that reaches out to you. They have even counselors and life coaches. And this specific picture is for the I3 Reverts group that helps specifically the Revert Muslims. And the previous one, Sister Hajra. There is another organization of UK that I mentioned in my Noah and mentioned in my intro, Aira.org slash mentorship so for the sisters who want to help reverts i would strongly recommend you guys to sign up for this free program it's only a four-day thing it's like one day per week kind of a thing and it's a mentorship program it's just a two-hour session for four days so that's eight hours and you learn like how to handle and tackle with, with situations from reverts and basically it'll give you all the tools in order to help a revert and make you prepared for anything that comes up inshallah it so we should will be ending have, here with the we have one more question yeah go ahead so um the questions from nuha i'm it says, what advice or words would you give to your past self or any other sisters experiencing a boycott from their families? Um, I would tell myself, I, I, I honestly wouldn't change anything. Uh, the only thing that I would have changed is I got married when I was 19, okay? So I got married when I was young. And I would only suggest to my past self that I would have rather finished my university and waited and then got married, at least establish my career and be strong on my own legs rather than rushing into marriage. And that is one of the things that I've noticed even among my other reward sisters that they also get married pretty soon. So I would strongly recommend learn about some Islamic knowledge about marriage laws and marriage contract and meher and what are meherims and things like that before rushing into marriage. And um, that's one suggestion that I would give back to my old self. And the, the one that I would like to share with others to do is just stand by what Allah says to do. For me, I know my parents, I know my family, right? Like if I would have stepped back with my hijab and I would have compromised with that the next thing would be oh go back being Hindu you know so just follow what Allah says and go through that path and I know what's right for me and even though like you know um, if I'm not comfortable with what I'm dressing or if I'm comfortable with what I am dressing, it should be my choice, not anybody else's choice. Same thing with religion and faith. It's solely my choice. I am grateful to my parents. They raised me the way I am. A strong, bold, and confident woman. Alhamdulillah. But at the same time, I have the right to choose my faith and what I wear. And they're okay with that now. So that's my, my suggestion to others. That's all. I think we can close up with the closing dua. Sister Amna. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Um, I was so into 
your um, lecture today, mashallah, and lots of duas for you and for all our sisters who have faced those circumstances in their lives. And as um, Humaira, Sister Humaira already said, there is uh, ease after every hardship. And um, you know what? Allah's rewards are the best rewards. So inshallah, you will be rewarded. You all will be rewarded with the best of the rewards. I mean, um, I'll do the dua. A'uzu billahi minash shaitanir rajim. Bismillahi r-Rahmani r-Rahim. Subhanakallah. Huma wa bihamdika nashadu Allah ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. How perfect you are, O Allah, and we praise you. We bear witness that none has a right to be worshipped except you. We seek your forgiveness and turn to you in repentance. Uh, may, may we love each other for the sake of Allah. May Allah make the Quran the light in our lives, in our graves, and on the day of judgment. May Allah make us the true Muslim, a true follower of our deen. May Allah make us as our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was with everyone in his life, kind, honest, trustworthy, loving, peace lover, generous, caring, pleasant, cooperative, modest. Uh, may Allah bless us all with those qualities. May Allah make all our sisters blessed with goodness in both worlds. May Allah bless our reward sisters with the right Correct knowledge of our deen, may they bless with people who can guide them towards the everything they might need to learn more and to stay strong on their religion. Ameen, summa ameen, and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Over to Noha or Fatima. Jazakallah khair, Sister Amna. Jazakallah khair to everyone who attended our session today. I hope we all learned something today. Alhamdulillah. I think with that we can say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and we'll see you all tomorrow inshallah.